Next, I'd like to introduce Ellie Weisbaum. She's worked, uh, she works at the University of Toronto as an assistant professor in Buddhism, psychology, and mental health, the mental health program. She has a joint appointment to the departments of psychiatry and the Temerty Faculty of Medicine, and a cross appointment at the Dalla Lana School of Public Health in their Institute of Health Policy Management and Evaluation. And she's the co-director of the EASE Lab at the University of Toronto. And uh, very wonderfully, Ellie has practiced in the Plum Village tradition ever since she was a kid. So she really grew up in this practice and uh, is now a scientist researching it. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Pleasure to be up here with you. Hey, sisters, thanks for the waves. <laughs> So uh, yeah, grateful to be here to explore this. I was sitting there thinking, oh, this is fun. The neuroscientist before me just gave a Dharma talk. And me, the qualitative researcher uh, who just became a Dharma teacher in the Plum Village tradition, is going to run through some methods and methodologies for you at a rapid pace. Uh, so I think this is a really uh, joyful way to say that I'm infinitely curious about bringing together different knowledge streams. And I think today we really get to dance with that. Uh, so I'm in my presentation giving myself permission. I'm going to go rapidly. I was saying there's a pace I use when I'm at a monastery in a Dharma hall, and one I use at Grand Rounds, and we're going to get a bit of both right now. I have more slides than I can share, but I want to put them up here because my intention for this presentation is to illustrate for those in the room who may be interested in doing research, those who want to bring this practice into their academic spaces, just a whole bunch of things that I'm up to. So if I go fast, I've already said I'm happy to share these slides, but I really wanted to dive through a bunch of things and then take a little bit more time at the end to drop into a short practice. So that's what I'm playing with. I'm passionate, I can talk fast, but it's gonna be okay. Uh, so just a quick calligraphy from our teacher, Tai. Uh, happy teachers will change the world. I like to say when I teach my students, Ty has many proposals for us, uh, but Ty would ask us, don't just take my word for it. Uh, so just very briefly, I'd like to invite everyone in this room just to take a moment to think of a teacher you loved from anywhere in your life, and if you're online, just to think, maybe from your childhood, wherever. Just think about why did they pop to mind? And we don't have time to go around and hear from everyone, but I've asked this question all over the world. And I often hear the qualities of that person. I haven't heard like, I love my grade four teacher because they taught me like math. You know, I've heard they cared, they took extra time with me, they made the classroom fun. And so my own lived experience in talking with people is that this proposal from Ty, happy teachers will change the world, uh, may have some grounding in reality. And so I've added some other things. We might think happy scientists will change the world, happy students will change the world, happy staff, admin, clinicians, parents, and so this proposal for all of us uh, to consider this in our work and our lives. This is a land acknowledgement from the University of Toronto, and I'll just offer us the end of it because we already had a beautiful one for the lands here. I read this at the beginning of every single class. I talk three classes a semester, so three times a week. I was invited to listen and learn and grow, and I think we heard from Sarah how congruent so many of these teachings that we have from Buddhist psychology and scholarship openness, non-dogmatism really are congruent with, I think, I hope, what our aspirations are as scientists. So a little bit about my research. Uh, I wanted to quote uh, John Kabat-Zinn, who it's fun to say hi to here, has this beautiful article from 2011 where he did some reflections on his work. And since I was a PhD student, I've been quoting this wonderful article, this intention to build bridges between science and dharma. And we heard this is also a continuation of some of Tai's dreams for us. And at the beginning of my PhD, it's 400 pages, if anyone wants to read it, it's in the U of T library. Uh, there's also a short protocol paper I'm gonna share with you now. Uh, there was a quote from Tai from his wonderful book, The Sun, My Heart, that I highly recommend if you're interested in the methodology of our trainings. And this quote has walked with me and I offer it to all of us as scientists and humans looking at the bridges of science and dharma. Meditators since the beginning of time have known that they must use their own eyes and the language of their own times to express their insight. Wisdom is a living stream, not an icon to be preserved in a museum. Only when a practitioner finds the spring of wisdom in his or her or their own life can it flow to future generations. Keeping the torch of wisdom glowing is the work of all of us who know how to clear a path through the forest in order to walk ahead. 
And for me, I love this quote for many reasons. And one is this permission to iterate uh, that this body of knowledge we're talking about, and sometimes I'm asked, why Buddhist scholarship? Why that field? There's, you know, compassion wisdom is not owned, a commodity owned by any one, you know, community or institution, uh, that we find this wisdom all over the world in so many of our human traditions. Uh, and yet there's something particular here. As a scientist, we like to be precise. I like to say, as scientists, you know, our, our, for a study design, qual or quant is not better than the other. It's like, what fits your research question? What fits your study design? And so for me, here we have a body of knowledge that for so many, many years has been interested in this research question, there is suffering, and how do we address and train thriving and wellness and flourishing? And it's an open source body of knowledge, right? Uh, from its inception, uh, the Buddha said, take this, iterate it, use it. Now I'd like to appreciate it and cite it properly and not appropriate it, that's a whole other lecture for another time. And this permission from our teacher Tai, right? Make it the language of your times. And so I really invite everyone in this room, I hope what I'm about to fly through in terms of methodologies, take it, use it. Uh, my protocol and findings paper have all of my like REB interview guides, like freely use it. Because I hope everyone here, in your own spaces, in your own disciplines, everything you hear today, make it the language of your times. That's your discipline, that's your space. In healthcare we talk about context specific research. So whatever all of us say up here, in qualitative research, we are not interested in replicatability, because we know in the behavioral studies side, like who I am in this moment is different than tomorrow, so I can't really claim that I replicated something exactly. But we're interested in transferability, right? That we can see the precedent and we can see how it transfers into different spaces of human behavior. So uh, just to be clear, so I go into a lot of healthcare and educational settings. I like to start with the, uh, this emoji eye roll because uh, it's a common and fair response to like wellness and mindfulness initiatives. Uh, we've often in these spaces had like a pizza party as like here's how we'll fix everything. And so I think it's really important when we go in, uh, Ty like to say call it by its true names, call our suffering by its true names. So for each of us as we bring this into different contexts, I think it's so important to say there's no one modality that can address the systemic issues we're facing in these different spaces. Uh, and that mindfulness is a possible modality, uh, that we want to consider things at both systems and individual levels, um, and again, whose voices are included or not included in research. So lots of questions. As I said, I'm going to fly through these. We'll share the slides. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about a specific study I did. There's so much I could share how I bring this into classrooms, but I wanted to focus on a particular study uh, so you can all start imagining what might this look like? How do we bring these teachings into you know, ethics institutionally reviewed spaces? So this is the study. It's published, as I said, open source, so please go there and take whatever is useful. Um, the study had two main foci, so this study I was looking at bringing Thich Nhat Hanh's teaching specifically uh, to physician wellness. Uh, and so we were looking at a mindfulness program that's tailored specifically to the needs of a population and examining feasibility, acceptability, and impact on daily life. Uh, so this was a prospective qualitative study, uh, quickly on the methods, it has institutional ethics approval uh, from the Hospital of Sick Children, uh, which is one of our main teaching researching hospitals in downtown Toronto and the University of Toronto. We did purposive sampling, so looking at how we can sample for specificity uh, with longer years in medical practice, less years mindfulness experience. Data was generated through participant observation, semi-structured interviews, uh, used thematic analysis for those of you uh, thinking about also bridging language, uh, biomedical to qualitative. I find TA is a fantastic kind of systematic approach to analysis uh, that can support the kind of findings we're looking for, but also be reflective of our Buddhist perspective that things are cyclical and sometimes we go back and change them. So they work together quite well. And as I said, the protocol is published, so please use whatever is helpful. So this was my research question, qualitative research, rather than a hypothesis that's making a priori assumptions, we're looking at reading the data very closely and finding out what it wants to say. And in this case, we were looking at applied mindfulness and its impact on the personal well-being uh, in the context of daily life. And so why physicians, whole literature review, I know many in here are familiar with the burnout uh, in those populations, uh, but just to say they play a critical role in our healthcare delivery systems own well-being is often overlooked, um, and some key factors uh, that are leading to levels of attrition uh, has to do with prioritizing the wellness of others, and that we really see this reflected across uh, the literature of caring professions and society. 
Uh, maybe by a show of hands, who here has experienced any feeling of exhaustion or burnout in the last month? Okay. How about in the last week? Last 24 hours? I would, yeah. Uh, so again, that I think what I'm presenting has some transferability uh, into our lives collectively. Uh, as again, I said, you can look at the paper for literature review, but lots of interesting reasons why we're curious about bringing these practices into healthcare spaces, uh, seeing benefits both for clinicians, for patients, and really the whole ecosystem. And Ty has said beautifully in his writing, what if our places of health, of healthcare settings, of hospitals, were places where everyone went to feel well? And that's a real curiosity I have. Are those of us walking into those spaces, are we, are we curing only pathology or do we feel well there? And then just a note for those of us in this field that I'm really interested also in what is the language? How are we narrating our research? And so I really try and look at what is asset-based language, um, looking at wellness and flourishing uh, rather than deficit-based. So can burnout be the motivator to want to explore this? And how am I talking about it? Am I combating burnout, which is like a little violent? Or from Thai, if the practice of mindfulness is always nonviolent, then what is the language also as a researcher that I bring to my research that is inviting and that is nonviolent to my research itself? And so I was curious about this, a young researcher, uh, and I was interested in Thai's teachings. As researchers, we like to be precise. Uh, and sometimes I read studies and I'm like, I don't know, it said meta practice, but like, what, from where? What's the, what's the lineage this comes from? And so just like we would cite our sources very precisely on the science side, I think we can also cite our sources very clearly on the mindfulness side. So I went in uh, to look specifically at Thai's teachings, uh, and I wanted to base a training for physicians on applied mindfulness, which is, you know, in the literature, Thai has been uh, attributed to coining the terms engaged and applied, and so I wanted to use that term. And so I coded uh, a five-day retreat, and I also wanted to establish um, an iterative reciprocal relationship. So as I did my PhD in this work, I took a precedent from indigenous research methodologies uh, to look at what it means to work with a community in collaboration and partnership and have them involved in all phases of a research study. So I lovingly had a PAC, a program advisory committee at the university, and a MAC, which was my monastic advisory committee from Plum Village, and you'll see them thanked and credited uh, in the research paper. And so I decided to code a five-day retreat of Thais, uh, who is a bit of a master of introducing people to engage in applied mindfulness, and to see what is the flow of a five-day introductory retreat, and could we translate that? And so this came about into a five-week program, uh, one session per week consecutively, two hours a week, so also working with a busy population, they're like, how many hours? Uh, and 10, I did a whole bunch of uh, research and discussion with uh, medical associations, and 10 hours seemed palatable. So that was what we wound up on. Uh, and the content is, again, on uh, published. This is from the publication, but it just shows how we were including both lectures, take-home activities, practices. For those of you at the retreat, uh, we were looking at, Ty is really curious about both scholarship and practice. I think that's a really fun part about our tradition. We like to nerd out on, on both sides. Uh, and so you can see the physicians um, responded quite well to hearing both lectures, uh, didactic learning, and then also integrated practice. And this is just a quick uh, example of the sample we had. So you can see we had a wide range of specialties included in the study. Um, and we had, for our sample size as a qualitative study, considered robust using the theory of information power. So again, we had longer term uh, medical practitioners, less years of mindfulness experience. So with my last few minutes, I just wanna share with you some of the data from the study and some of the main thematic findings that we found from physicians who participated in this program. And one of the interesting things was a main theme that came out was mindfulness becomes a way of life. Uh, that they were pleasantly surprised by the fact that they had thought meditation was sitting in a room with your eyes closed for 20 minutes in the morning just hoping it lasted. Uh, and one of the physicians said to me, no, it's like on demand. Like I can be running down a hallway uh, and I can still access this thing. Uh, two main themes were found. So mindfulness encourages behavioral and cognitive changes that facilitate well-being and mindfulness improves communication with patients and colleagues. 
And as a qualitative researcher, I like to stick closely to the data. So I want to invite us to do for the end of my presentation is to really hear the voices of the physicians who participated. Uh, so it's not just my claims or what I wanted to see, but what was actually experienced and said. So for the first quote, or for the first theme, that there's an encouragement of behavioral and cognitive changes that facilitate well-being. And we like to keep uh, the quotes uh, kind of in context as qualitative researchers, so you'll see uh, the area and specialty of each of the physicians and how many years of practice to kind of inform what we're hearing. But let's just think about this. I'm making the claim that there are behavioral and cognitive changes that facilitate well-being, that decrease workplace stressors resulting in a greater sense of wellness. Why would I say that? Here's what I heard. I end up at the end of the day with a happier day, and that means I come home happier. I don't bring back all of the frustration and stuff that was happening throughout the day. You just take a breath for yourself. You are less anxious, and you are less worried, or you don't panic as much. The mindful walking was good. When I was getting to the meeting or to the patient, I was more relaxed and more present in a way. I think I am more forgiving with myself and with my patients. Just imagine that space, that hospital space, and that second theme, that there's a benefit to communication with patients and colleagues, delivery of care, work relationships, team dynamics. And so just to listen again to a forensic psychologist, emergency medicine surgeon, I think that in patients and with irritability, it's a two-way street, I feel that awareness lets me step out of it. Normally, it will just escalate. But then I think in many cases now with mindfulness, I will try and kind of step away and approach it in a more empathetic way. You come back to your mindful breathing and it helps you to cope with almost every situation. It gives you immediately the way to react differently and better. Going from one patient to the next, I now take the time to breathe so that I am able to start over and give my full to the next patient. Because you listen more, you don't already make decisions in your head before you've actually heard them, the patient out. Mindfulness brought me back and probably being more compassionate, which makes me a better kind of doctor, a whole doctor. And so just hearing those voices that just in 10 hours of, of starting to touch this practice, we started to hear uh, these shifts. <sighs> so I know I'm at time, so I'm just gonna show you the other slides. I'm just gonna click through them, know that they're here for you. I will share them. Uh, there's a further discussion around, you know, kind of the summary of these findings. Uh, the top hits, what were their favorite flavors of practices, and this is a graphic that's freely available and downloadable, so please go get it for yourselves. Uh, small doses of mindfulness work, so we heard kind of different folks where they apply it, uh, surgeons while it's being cleaned. We have future directions, you know, always l strengths and limitations, no need to wait. At the same time, our systems uh, have things built in that make it very challenging, and I'll just end by really thanking the participants, the physicians who took that time to spend time with me, to share with me, my PAC, my monastic advisory committee. Um, it's such a gift to do this together. So we'll share more resources, but just to end, I'd like to invite a sound of the bell. Uh, as a scientist up here, I had a clicker, and I also have a bell, so two, uh, two modalities up here, um, and just a gift to be here with all of you, and I invite us, when we hear this bell, uh, just to come home to ourselves, and a real invitation and permission our home does not mean insta calm and happy, uh, because we know that sometimes if the world around us is busy, then our inner landscape may also be messy. Uh, so just an invitation that I'm not inviting you to feel instantly and perfectly happy and calm, but just a moment to come home and say hello to whatever is here. Thank you.